Uh, so, good evening, uh, and in some cases, uh, depending on where you're watching, uh, it's good morning, or possibly even uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this is um, uh, Urban Dharma, North Carolina's uh, regular, uh, or this slot, uh, every Thursday uh, from 7.30 uh, to 9 p.m. Uh, is uh, Urban Dharma, North Carolina's uh, usual open sangha time. Uh, we need uh, this, the format that we use is uh, the first half hour is meditation and then a short break and followed by uh, teachings or instructions or discussion. Um, so last week I announced the start of a new series on Lojong, uh, that is going to be the focus of Open Sangha uh, for a little while. Um, I also mentioned that uh, eventually, uh, after a few more, I think, of these um, Thursday night uh, Lojong uh, focus, uh, then I'm going to schedule also uh, several times a week, uh, maybe late in the afternoon, early evening, a half an hour uh, guided meditation based on the Lojong uh, teachings that we have been uh, learning. So uh, we will start now uh, with the guided meditation for about half an hour. Yeah, so um, Let's uh, do that, and uh, you can uh, now try to sit comfortably, and then we will start the guided meditation part. And this will go for about half an hour. Uh, and I'm going to basically give you uh, the instructions given in the Lojong tradition uh, on how uh, to um, prepare uh, what it calls the preliminary training that is necessary and so that it becomes the support, it becomes the foundation, it becomes the basis for us to practice uh, the two main practices uh, that you will find uh, in the Lojong tradition. And the two main meditations in the Lojong tradition uh, is the meditation on absolute bodhicitta and meditation on relative bodhicitta. And it is within the meditation on relative bodhicitta that the very well-known uh, meditation practice of Donglen uh, is taught. But before uh, this um, engaging in, uh, starting uh, meditating on uh, the absolute bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. Uh, don't worry if these terms are unfamiliar to you because um, the series uh, is to help us get acquainted uh, with these terms. Uh, but before doing this main uh, practice, main meditation practices, uh, two types, the absolute bodhicitta meditation and the relative bodhicitta meditation, um, we first have to develop a foundation, a support for those two other meditations. And that's using the technique of establishing presence, establishing presence through um, being mindful of breath. Establishing presence through being mindful of our breathing, of breath. So that's what uh, we will first focus on.
please allow both your body and mind to quiet down, to settle down, to settle into their own places. Let body settle comfortably. Let body settle in a balanced and stable way onto the seat that you're sitting on. To find that balance, to find that stability, you might initially do very subtle swaying a little of your body and imagining your body like a pendulum swinging that slowly, naturally swinging until it finds its place of rest, until it finds its equilibrium. And in that way, just settle. As your body settle, you might find that taking a few long, slow, deliberate breaths can actually help the body be more relaxed, more open, less tense, and more at ease. In settling the body, two key points to watch for. One, you want to be seated, stable, and unmoving like a mountain, majestic, confident. And second point, you want to be seated upright. And to do that, initially you might try a few times elongating your spine, imagining as if there's something pulling you upwards as you elongate your spine. And hold a few moments even in this with tension and then slowly release and let your spine, let your back settle. And in this way, find that place of equilibrium, find that place of quiet and ease for your body. As your body settles, the pattern of your breath also begins to regulate itself and settle. You might find your breath becoming more subtle, less obvious. But I can guarantee you it's still going on. It's just that as the body settles, your breath naturally also finds its own pace and settles down. So just naturally let your breath settle. If anything, you should get out of the way so that your body will breathe the way that it is supposed to breathe, and the way that it will breathe. 
and you get out of the way. Breath is fundamentally a property of the body and therefore directly related to the body. And it forms a bridge to mind so that true breath, body and mind can be united. Body and mind can arrive at their own places of rest of openness, of spaciousness. Spaciousness, not just of mind, but spaciousness of body can also develop. If we know how to relate to breath. In the Lojong tradition, using breath as an object of meditation is for the purpose of establishing presence, or what's normally translated as calm abiding. Know that for the purposes of this course, the series, I'm going to use the word presence. So the technique of paying attention to breath is aimed at helping us to establish presence, to be present where the body is present, to be present where breath is taking place. to turn up 100% right here. To take your place in life and to be fully present. The ability to be present is innate, but due to the habits, habits of distraction, the habit of being dragged around by our thoughts, by our emotions, the habit of being dragged around and around and around has caused us to almost lose the ability to be present. Hence the need to train in meditation and in the Lojong teachings. It says that we should try to count our breath up to 21. So each inhalation and exhalation is one. Then the next inhalation and exhalation is two. You should count in this way. But it's important when you're counting, be sure that you're counting breath as it arises and ceases, rather than using your counting to control your breath. Let your counting follow your breath rather than have your breath follow your counting. So at your own pace, when you are ready, you can start the counting. But the moment you discover that you have lost your count, start again and go back to one. And last week I introduced 
a way that might be helpful for beginners, which is to count in three sets of seven. So that you begin with the first inhalation, you say one, and the exhalation, you mentally note one. Then the next inhalation, one, but exhalation, you say two, then one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, one, seven. And then two, one, two, 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 three, and all the way to two, seven, and then three, one, all the way to three, seven, and in that way, you arrive at 21. Then after that, you might just drop the counting and just relax the mind. And when you are feel that you're ready again, you can begin the count again. But wherever you find yourself losing count, then start again from the beginning or the beginning of the set, if you're doing it in the sets of seven, then you need to only go back to the beginning of the set where you lost count. So at your own pace, when you're ready, you can start that counting and in between 21 counts. Just relax. Give yourself some space, some time to just relax before you count again. But we have to be determined at the start of doing this counting that I am not going to lose count. So yes, there will be some kind of tension but this is a skillful type because you're harnessing your attention. You're sharpening your presence. So that even though at the beginning, it might seem a little forced, but this is skillful force. This is skillful shaping or harnessing of attention, of presence.
so we will take a few moments of break. Uh, you can uh, stretch a little bit, maybe go get uh, something to drink. Meanwhile, I want to remind everyone to please, uh, if you are watching, participating from on Zoom, through Zoom, please make sure you mute your uh, microphone on your end uh, so that if there's any sounds uh, on your side, it doesn't suddenly uh, turn up on everyone's feed. So please check your uh, settings, make sure that you mute uh, your uh, microphone. Then of course, later when we have question and answers, uh, when you are going to ask uh, anything, uh, also remember to unmute. Yeah.
Uh, so, um, we are still learning uh, how to do all of this uh, and uh, feedback uh, from uh, Facebook and from Zoom uh, is going to help us <laughs> get all this right. Um, yes, I think some of you uh, I saw on Facebook is asking, uh, um, how to join uh, this program uh, through Zoom. Uh, and um, so uh, the way to do it uh, is um, mm, we will let you know. Uh, basically, you will send, if you're interested in joining this through Zoom, uh, send an email, send an email to info at udharmanc.com, info at uh, I-N-F-O at U, uh, the alphabet U for United, uh, rather urban, U, then Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, N-C uh, dot com. Uh, so send an email there. Um, and then uh, we will uh, email you uh, the Zoom details uh, in time for the uh, next class. So uh, anyway, um, mm, so this is uh, a new series eh, on the uh, Lojong uh, tradition, uh, the Lojong way of um, training the mind. Uh, so if you missed uh, last week's uh, introductory talk uh, on this, uh, I will strongly suggest that you go back and watch it. Uh, and that's available uh, on the Urban Dharma North Carolina Facebook page. And when you get to that page, uh, you should be able to see a tab that says uh, video. And if you click that, you know, all the videos that we have ever published uh, remains there. And so then you can look at it there. So um, the Lojong tradition uh, has actually many uh, different uh, texts Many different uh, texts have been composed in the last, uh, I would say, thousand years. And so that uh, there is a whole genre of um, texts that are considered Lojong texts. In fact, uh, wisdom publications uh, publish uh, a collection of Lojong texts called uh, Mind Training, the Great Collection. Mind Training, the Great Collection, uh, was published several years back. Uh, and that is a collection that was compiled of, of a couple of hundred years at least, a couple of hundred years back, compiled uh, by a Tibetan uh, master and scholar of this Lojung tradition. It's called the Mind Training, The Great Collection. It's part of Wisdom Publications um, Library of Tibetan Classics works. And so if you're interested uh, in kind of knowing more about Lojong, uh, you can uh, check out that book. Um, then one of the earliest uh, Lojong texts is the one that we are anchoring uh, our series on, which is called the Mahayana Lojong in Seven Points. So I'm going to ask someone, and you know who you are, to please type these things. When I mention text, when I mention books, to please type it uh, on Facebook and also on the Zoom chat so that uh, 
people don't have to go, what, what? <laughs> if I'm mentioning email address too, please type it on the chat uh, for Zoom and also uh, on Facebook feed uh, in the comments. And this will be very helpful uh, to everyone. Uh, so the Mahayana uh, Lojong in uh, seven point um, is one of the earliest uh, Lojong texts. Uh, and uh, scholars, historians and specializing in this area uh, think that the author of this text, uh, who is called Geshe Chikawa, was probably the first person uh, to publicly teach this Lojong tradition. And he is, uh, let's see, fourth generation, third, fourth generation from uh, the person who is considered the originator of the Lojong tradition, or at least the person who brought this tradition from India to Tibet, and that is Atisha. Atisha uh, was someone who lived in India, in Western India, in, in, in mostly what we today would call Bangladesh, which is Western India, uh, the Bengal area. So he was a Bengali. Uh, of course, he also went to Central India, to Nalanda. Uh, but, but he was the one, uh, according to Tibetans, who brought the Lojong tradition to Tibet and then subsequently taught Lojong uh, to his Tibetan disciples. But what's really interesting here is um, I think it's helpful to know that according to the tradition, it is said that uh, Atisha did not explicitly uh, teach Lojong to uh, most of his Tibetan students. In fact, it is said that uh, he only taught Lojong privately. The, the text sometimes say secretly, okay? but I think uh, it, it communicates better if we say that he taught it privately rather than publicly. He taught it uh, to a few persons whenever the occasion uh, came up, rather than teaching it to big groups of people. And he had big groups of people. He, he had a big audience because he was actually uh, invited by uh, the king of Tibet at that time, specifically Western Tibet. He was invited by the king of Tibet to help re-establish Buddhism in Tibet. After Tibet experienced about an interruption of about a hundred years, there was a, a setback to the flourishing of Buddhism in Tibet for about a hundred years. And, and that setback was remedied when Atisha arrived in Tibet. And so he had a, a ready audience supported by the king, but it is said that in his public teachings he did not teach Lojong. Uh, he only taught it privately and he only taught it to a few of his students. That I think should tell us something and it might help us kind of appreciate and understand and know how to approach this Lojong tradition. These days the Lojong tradition uh, understandably, and that is, you know, the reason why I'm even uh, doing this series is that in many, many ways, uh, these Lojong instructions are so uh, practical, so direct, so applicable, and so, makes so much sense, you know. But why didn't Atisha teach this to many people? I think that has, this has something to do with, uh, at the same time, although the words and the expressions in the Lojong tradition 
does not have a lot of technical terms. In fact, uh, if you have downloaded the Geshe Cheka was Mahayana Lojong in seven points. If you downloaded the text from the link that I provided, uh, you'll see that there's not a lot of um, technical terms. Uh, here and there, of course, there is. Uh, best, but as you proceed along, you know, at the beginning, there are some technical terms. Uh, but later on, there's almost no technical terms, uh, just simple language. So the simplicity of the language can kind of fool us sometimes. Uh, we can mistakenly think, you know, oh, these are just, you know, common sense, you know, stuff that is said in a commonsensical way, you know, and then we might underestimate the power of this tradition. And in fact, it might even be taken out of context. So, Atisha felt that unless, I would say Atisha felt that unless you have a, a good foundation in the basic Buddhism, so to say, Buddhism 101, where you understand the kind of general framework of the Buddhist teachings, to directly go to Lojong, he probably felt that it could kind of give the wrong impression. Remember that part of his job was to reestablish the Buddhism that has declined in Tibet. So then he, he had to focus more on what's known as the uh, graduated or the gradual path known in Tibetan as Lamrim. So he taught Lamrim, which is, I would say, a systematic presentation of Buddhism from like, you know, step one to two to three to four. So in fact, he considered the Lojong teachings to be fairly advanced, fairly advanced teachings. Uh, and so uh, this, I think, further emphasizes the point that when we now uh, learn Lojong, not just intellectually, but as a practice. First of all, I think we should not underestimate the profundity of these statements, even though they are very common language, not much technical terms. But ironically, of course, for us, that's an advantage. You know, most of us are not familiar with all the complexity of Buddhist tradition. Uh, but even as we are approaching mm, these simple words, mm, we should remember, you know, for Atisha and his community, they considered this uh, to be a fairly advanced practice. And in fact, as we shall see, it is. Because what is the main practice in Lojong? It is to train in bodhicitta. To train in bodhicitta. So I think first we need to talk about then, what is bodhicitta? Bodhicitta is a compound, it's a Sanskrit word. It's a compound consisting of bodhi on the one hand and citta on the other. And the other part is citta. Citta is mm, mind. But here maybe perhaps you could say, yeah, you could say mind. Let's just leave it at mind. Citta as mind. Bodhi is awaken or awakening. Bodhi is awakened or awakening. And what that means is right now, according to the Buddha, we are all unawakened and the, the 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 connotation there of being unawakened is we are confused we are existing in a dream and we don't even know that and so in this dream we have all kinds of misconceptions we have all kinds of wrong views we have all kind of all kinds of misunderstandings 
And because of these misunderstandings, because of not understanding that we are right now in an unawakened state, therefore, we suffer. Therefore, we are unhappy. Because everything that we try to do to be happy is based on not understanding what is going on. <laughs> so no matter what kind of fancy things that we try to do within this dream, the fundamental not recognizing that we are stuck in a dream is going to make sure that you know, whatever we try is not going to bring any lasting effect. It's not going to bring the lasting happiness that we want. So we need to wake up. We need to become awakened, which is what Buddha is the awakened one, or the awakened ones, because Siddhartha is just one example of an awakened one, what Buddhists call Buddha. Bodhi can mean awakened and also awakening. Uh, in this sense, we could say both awaken and awakening can be used to refer to. Now, further definitions. There are two types of bodhicitta, it is said. There is ultimate bodhicitta and conventional bodhicitta. Uh, we can go into the ins and outs of these definitions, but the definition, the working definition that I think uh, I want to share with you is basically absolute bodhicitta pertains to or foregrounds the wisdom aspect of this mind. And relative bodhicitta pertains to the love and compassion aspect of this mind. And Buddhists are the embodiment of both relative and absolute bodhicitta. Awakened ones are awakened because both these bodhicittas have become fully uh, actualized. So right now, what we need to train, if we want to wake up, if we want to become an awakened one, if we want to be freed from the dream that we are stuck in, then we have to train to uncover, to develop, to uncover, sometimes it's useful to think of it as developing, uh, as if it is not there yet. And sometimes it's useful to think of it as uncovering, uh, as it has always been there, but just hidden. Uh, these are the two modes. Uh, sometimes, you know, when, when some Buddhists get too into it, you know, they will debate, you know, which is actually the case. <laughs> is it something that you need to develop? Is it something that you need to uncover? I think those are debates that you know we don't need to get into. In fact, the way I understand it, I think sometimes it's useful to think of it in one way, and sometimes it's useful to think of it in another way, which is also generally my understanding of how all these different teachings and practices are intended for us. The Buddha has said, you know, what he taught us are fingers pointing to the moon. It's not the moon itself. So he always says that you rely on these methods to finally see the moon. So to that degree, these methods are important. But if we become fixated on the methods and forget that they are noble strategies, this, I like this expression. This expression I think is coined by uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu. Uh, uh, a, a senior monk uh, in the Thai forest tradition, uh, also a excellent scholar of the Pali tradition. Uh, he coined this term, uh, 
uh, noble strategies. So all the teachings that the Buddha gave us you know, are noble strategies. And so if we know how to adopt these strategies, these methods, then they can free us. They can lead us to the state of being awake. So sometimes you can look at bodhicitta as something that is already inherently there, waiting to be uncovered. And sometimes we should think of bodhicitta as something that is potentially there and needing to be developed. In other words, you know, when we get too lazy, then we have to start thinking of bodhicitta as something to be developed. To be, that you have to gather all the causes and conditions together, and that you have to kind of tweak here a little bit, tweak here a little bit. You have to patiently kind of cultivate until it becomes clear, it becomes obvious. And then when you find your, your practice becoming too tight, you know, oh, I need this, I need this, oh, but I cannot get that, you know, like, oh, I don't have the circumstances, and, you know, and then you get all tied up, you know, and that's when you need to kind of step back a little and understand, you know, bodhicitta, you know, is already there. All I have to do is to uncover it. All I have to do is to discover it. So you see how, right? You have to kind of know, huh? how to use what the Buddha has given us and, and not forget that no matter how profound the teachings, no matter what the salesmen say, how great this method is or that method is at the end of the day, what makes the method great is the person employing the method. What makes the method great is depends on the person who is using the method. So, coming back to Lojong. So Lojong, uh, so then the particular text that we're using, Mahayana Lojong in seven points, It's one of the oldest, and it has also withstood the test of time, so that even though it's one of the oldest uh, Lojung texts that we have, it continues to this day to be one of the most popular Lojung texts. And here, Geshe Chekawa organizes these pithy sayings into seven points. You could even call them like seven chapters. Some chapters are very short, just one line. Chapter one, only one line. Some chapters are long, such as chapter six and seven, where there's like you know, at least uh, like uh, 10 to 20 uh, one-liners. And they're all one-liners, basically. There are one or two where it's more than a line. But they're all one-liners. So much so that then, quite popularly, uh, there is uh, this kind of er people who know this Lojong teachings, they'll say, oh, there are 59 slogans uh, or 59 one-liners. <laughs> um, so chapter one, uh, which is the chapter on presentation of the preliminaries, has only one line. And that one line, it's a very simple line. That one line says, in the translation that I'm using, it says, first, train in the preliminaries. So right now, in terms of preliminary, uh, let's just say uh, the counting of breath to 21 uh, is one of these important preliminaries. It's one of these important foundational work. 
It's one of these important foundations we, that we have to build. If, we, if you don't have a strong foundation, whatever else you try to build, it's not going to last. Yeah, if your building starts cracking, if things start to fall off, it's because the foundation is not strong. If you have practiced the Dharma, if you have engaged in spiritual practice for a long time, you know, five years, 10 years, and then you feel like, you know, wait, is it working or not working? Not much seems to have changed. Then you're like, I even did this retreat and that retreat. You know, I went, I even went to this profound teaching and that profound teacher. And then you look and you say, wait, not much has changed. Actually, it's probably because the foundation is not strong. You were too eager to build something out of these precious things that you're hearing. Understandable. Because we want to build this, you know, we hear it's so wonderful. But if the foundation is not strong, if so the preliminaries is talking about the foundation. So if the foundation is not strong, then whatever else we try to build on top will be shaky. Then your, you know, all the frames, your window, you know, it starts, you know, going off. <laughs> then eventually, you know, whatever you build will fall apart. So foundation. Uh, next class, I will say more about uh, other preliminaries, uh, other things that are needed for this foundation. But the first foundation here then is the foundation of establishing presence, uh, establishing what otherwise is translated as a state of calm abiding. Uh, that phrase calm abiding uh, tells us actually very well too. Uh, one element is we are calm, we are serene, uh, we are at ease. Uh, and then abiding means remaining. Uh, remaining in that place where you are at ease uh, and you are present. Uh, so I said, you know, I'm going to use the expression establishing presence, to be present. There are also what's known as uh, the four thoughts uh, that turn our mind. And here, turn our mind. And so these four thoughts that turn our mind is also given in the earliest commentary of this Mahayana Lojong in Seven Points by Geshe Cheka was immediate student. And this text is translated in, in the big book I mentioned published by Wisdom Publications called uh, Mind Training, The Great Collection. It's in there. And in that text, the commentary for this first mind, he goes into detail telling us that we should contemplate, we should think about, we should try to get it into our system. These four points called the four thoughts, the four considerations to turn the mind. To turn the mind in what way? To turn the mind away from distractions, basically. And so you see how that, right? That four thoughts that turn the mind works to support the calm abiding, the establishing presence practice that we are doing with counting breath to 21. So slowly, slowly, I'm going to introduce the four thoughts that turn the mind in a more organic way. But sometimes, you know, I feel, I feel that, you know, we, we go immediately into ideas, you know, into considerations, into concepts, you know, and then we, we mistakenly think that that's the main thing that we are to practice. When in fact, it's counting breath to 21. That is the main thing that we should practice now if we want to practice Lojong. Right? It's to 
find ways. And, and the way given in the Lojong tradition is to count breath to 21, find ways to establish presence, to establish calm abiding. To do that, you can enhance that. Right? You can help that effort you know, to establish presence by also going through those four thoughts or four considerations right, to turn the mind away from distractions. Yeah, so this is the uh, briefly uh, that first point of training in the preliminaries. Uh, there's more to elaborate on training in the preliminaries. Last week, I said that I'm going to uh, share with you uh, this Lojong tradition, this Lojong in seven points, in a way that I feel is uh, a unique contribution to what's already available out there. My feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, maybe I have not just have not seen enough of what people are doing with this text out there. But generally the feeling that I've got by looking at available commentaries by modern teachers, and very good teachers, you know, in fact, masters in this tradition. But something that I have not seen clearly yet is the emphasis of paying attention to um, the fact that Geshe Chekawa organized these one-liners into seven chapters, into seven points. And that each chapter and each point uh, has a heading. And that heading, uh, that heading tells us a lot uh, as to how we are to skillfully use uh, those slogans or those one-liners uh, that are put into that particular chapter, that are put into that particular point. So in other words, I feel that uh, as far as Geshe Chekawa is concerned, these one-liners, uh, you do not relate to every single one of them in the same way. They function differently and therefore should be practiced differently. I think this point is really important. We have evidence that these one-liners are also arranged differently by other people. There are other Lojong texts where these one-liners are put into different order. So these one-liners must have been uh, orally transmitted within Atisha's uh, uh, descendants uh, as words of Atisha. But it was in the hands of Geshe Chekawa uh, that we have them in the form that we have today, organized into seven points, organized into seven chapters. And so what I'm emphasizing is that we want to take Geshe Chekawa's decision seriously. And so we should pay attention to the structure. So the structure basically, right? Again, to repeat, the seven points, the first point is regarding the preliminaries. The second point is the main training. And that's where the formal meditations for absolute bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta are taught. As well as post-meditation engagement with these two bodhicittas, they are also taught in the second point. And it's in the second point where, where uh, under the training in relative bodhicitta, the post-meditation training, it says train uh, with the sayings uh, or train with basically the one-liners. There, uh, he's referring to some of the other points, especially point six and point seven, uh, where there are the do's and the don'ts, uh, what's known as the uh, commitments of lojong, and the precepts of Lojong uh, in particular uh, is referring to train using that in the post meditation time. Uh, meaning when we are not doing the formal meditation of Tonglen, 
which is the meditation, formal meditation for relative bodhicitta, when we are not seated down doing the formal meditation of Donglen, when we step out up from the cushion in our day-to-day -day life, how do we cultivate relative bodhicitta? You cultivate it with help from, especially, the one-liners in point six and point seven. And so point six are called the commitments or the samaya of Lojong. There is sort of things that we have to, to keep, commitments that we have to keep so that our resolve to practice bodhicitta do not deteriorate. That's point six. Point seven, that called the precepts of Lojong, are things that we should actively do in order to make sure that our practice of bodhicitta increases, becomes stronger and stronger. So point six is about how not to let our resolve to practice bodhicitta deteriorate. Point seven is about how to make sure that in our day-to-day -day life, when situations arise, we could use them to make our relative bodhicitta practice stronger and stronger. Now, so Going back to point two is the main training of the two bodhicittas. Then point three is taking adversities onto the path. Taking adversities onto the path, meaning, you know, when difficulties arise in our life, and then sometimes difficulties that arise, you know, because we're practicing lojong, that can also happen. Uh, what are we going to do with those difficulties? How are we going to deal with those difficulties? How are we going to deal with those inconveniences? So that's the third point. Basically, the third point is like, you know, when things go crazy, you know, how should a lojong practitioner handle uh, this crazy stuff? Uh, so you could say that the third point is kind of like, you know, when the suffering is acute. Yeah? When the suffering is acute, yeah? what do we do? Point four, on the other hand, is called a lifetime's practice in summary. That then I would say is how to practice lojong when the suffering is more chronic. <laughs> so if point three uh, is to help us uh, when uh, acute suffering flares up, because most of us, you know, we don't have lives where, you know, difficulties are crashing down on our head all the time. Some of us might, but most of us don't have that. Then point four uh, is just Two one-liners, but compact, compact, because there it's, it's, it's basically saying, you know, if you want to summarize, what is it that we are practicing when you say that you are a Dharma practitioner, when you say you want to pay attention to the, your, your inner life, your internal life, then it says it's basically relying on five things. And then the next line says, and then when you're actively dying, this is how you continue to practice the five things. So this really says, you know, like if you really commit to this, you know, it should cover every aspect of your life. You cannot say, oh, now I'm dying. I don't have time to practice this anymore. But in fact, when you're dying, you know, that's a crucial time to put into practice, you know. But so many of us, you know, 
in the midst of our many deaths, meaning when things go wrong, right? That's a mini death. We forget to practice Dharma. For some of us, practicing Dharma is kind of like a um, part of our identity, you know? So we only practice Dharma when we feel good. In fact, I, I will confess, I, my feeling is I see that many people practice Dharma like this. Now, only when things are going well and it fits their image as a spiritual person, then they are inspired to practice Dharma. Oh, everything is going well. And, 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 you, and you get to look spiritual, you know, because that's your persona. You're a spiritual person. Then when things go wrong, you know, oh my God, this does not fit the image and the persona I want. Then Dharma flies out the window. And then I never see them, you know, when they're suffering. <laughs> I mean, you know, between friends uh, or, or acquaintance, I mean, good friends should not be like this, but as acquaintance, and I have more acquaintances, you know, than friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then as an acquaintance, yeah, I would rather only see you, you know, when you are happy, when things are going well. But in my role as a Dharma teacher, then I have to say to people, you know, don't forget, you know, when you're suffering, this is when you should really apply the Dharma. And if you need help, you know, this is when you should really not be shy, you know, and reach out. Anyway, the fourth point is a lifetime's practice in summary. Fifth point is the measure of having trained the mind. That's the one on, how do you know? How do you know that you are pursuing spiritual life? You are pursuing Dharma practice for the right reasons. And how do you know that you're doing it for the right reasons? And how do you know that it is going well or it is going not well? So last week I said, you know, that this week I'm going to focus on this. Clearly, looking at my watch, this is not going to be possible to cover the, 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 the fifth point. And I also said, you know, I'm going to be contrary to how this text is normally taught. I'm going to zoom into the fifth point first. Because since the fifth, fifth point is telling us, these are the one-liners you should look at if you want to know whether your Lojong practice is being done right or wrong, then this point can also help us as we're beginning to learn about this tradition to know what is the goal of this tradition? What is the goal of training according to this approach? Maybe tradition is a heavy word, approach. How, what, 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 how are we to know, you know, what this approach promises to deliver? Let's put it that way. Yeah? How do we know? Well, let's look. At, I, I should at least take one, one slogan, one, the first one-liner from this point so that I don't make myself a liar. So the first one-liner from the fifth point says, all dharmas converge on a single point. So that it turns up on the fifth point tells us that here, at least the way Geshe Chekawa right, has structured these one-liners, as I said, the one-liners probably did not originate from him because we have evidence of other Lojong texts having very similar one-liners, sometimes word for word. So if we cannot credit him with coming up with one-liners, we can credit him with putting them in a specific place. 
So he put this one liner here. So that means for Geshe Chekava, this is not saying that you should focus on making all dharmas converge on a single point. You, you understand what I'm saying? He's not saying yeah, that you should focus your energy on making all your dharma practice converge on a single point. What he is saying is, if you want to know whether you are doing this right, look at the different spiritual practices that you're doing. So in this context, we would say dharmas. In the Buddhist context, we will say the diff all the different teachings. Do you see all the different teachings that you have received? Do you see all the different methods that you have been introduced to as aimed at one purpose? Or do you think that it is for a whole bunch of different purposes? This is particularly relevant to the general style of Tibetan Buddhism. Unlike, say, Soto Zen. Soto Zen, basically one practice or one main practice, which is just sit. Shikantaza. Sit and practically sit and face the wall. From beginning to end, is sit and face the wall. Yes, of course, there is chanting, you know, but fundamentally one. In contrast, Tibetan Buddhism, five bazillion practices. And often, you know, you will hear, oh, this practice is for this, that practice is for that, and that practice is for this, and that practice is for that, you know. Like, like uh, you, you hear me say, you know, you have seen some of you, you know, I do the smoke offering, the cleansing offering. Uh, right now, you know, there is the, the Tara that dispels uh, epidemics uh, and, and all that. And, and it can seem like, oh my God, you know, like there's so many things to do. No. That's just externally. Yes, externally, it looks like there's many things to do. Externally, it looks like there's many things to learn. But when you begin to understand from the inside that all of this, all of these different practices that you're doing in the end, it's to dispel self-grasping. It's to dispel fixation. There's two aspects to that. One is to dispel fixation in general. And two is to dispel more specifically fixating on self. Fixating on self begins by general fixation. General fixation is when we are tight about everything. Even with our Dharma practice, we make it very tight. And if you continue to practice that way, you're never going to find any freedom. All you type A types, you have to resolve, you know, that you cannot do your Dharma practice that way. So you have to learn how to breathe. You have to learn how to breathe in space. Breathing in is basically introducing space. Other than the fact that you have to breathe in, otherwise you will be dead. Second, breathing in as a meditation practice is about inviting space into ourselves. Breathing out is also about space. As much as bringing space in is important, letting go now of that which is so amazing is also necessary. And that is breathing out. As much as, you know, the next breath is so important, you know, we breathe in. Ah, try holding on to that. <laughs> try fixating on 
Yeah, the breath that you have just brought in and given yourself so much space and feel so good. Now try holding on to that. You cannot. Then you let go and you feel space again. So space coming in, space going out. So, so when we can see that all the different practices that we're doing is to take us to releasing fixation. Then, next, fixating on I, me, and mine. Fixating on uh, I am more important. Stuck on operating, you know, operating on a way that you know just just about me, you know. Particularly when, uh, like when I don't feel good, you know, I'm going to lash out at anyone that comes my way. Or maybe some of us, you know, have favorite people that we will go punch when we're unhappy. That is all arising from being fixated on self. The opposite of this fixation is actualizing bodhicitta. So the main training of Lojo is to actualize the two bodhicittas. The bodhicitta that pertains to wisdom and the bodhicitta that pertains to love and compassion. So in the Lojong approach, it says, you know, we have to understand, you know, whatever that we are practicing, if we are practicing for any other reason uh, than the actualization of bodhicitta, uh, if we're practicing for any other reason than giving up on fixation, then we need to revisit the foundation. We need to refocus on the foundation and see where, where, where are the weak points in the foundation that we need to further and reinforce before we try to do more. Then quickly, mm. the next one-liner here is, of the two witnesses, uphold or rely on the principal one. What are the two witnesses? Self and other. So here again, it is, of course, you know, you, you could take this as saying, uh, this is what you should do. Uh, but Geshe Chekawa puts it here as a way to measure. So then you can ask yourself, right now, most of the time, am I looking at what's really going on inside uh, and on that basis decide what I should do or not do? Or am I relying on what other people are saying, uh, whether they are clapping or whether they are uh, yelling? That's the meaning. So the principal witness means your own mind. So you might look really good uh, to other people. I'm like, oh, wow, you're so spiritual, you're so loving, you know, you're so patient. But then inside, you know, you know, right? it's a big storm. <laughs> but if you get, you know, fooled by what other people are praising you, then you, you need to revisit where in your foundation it's still shaky. This can also work in a way like uh, in the end, you know, you should also not worry about other people criticizing you. Because if we worry too much about other people criticizing or not approving, 
then we will also be at their mercy. Now, it's also true, you know, like in another, in a more mundane way, you know, so we have to be careful about this, you know. Someone said, you know, uh, only two, uh, two types, I, I remember reading somewhere, uh, I like this, you know, only two types of beings uh, don't care, uh, completely don't care what other people think of them. One, a Buddhist. Two, complete jerks. So be careful, you know, that you are not just a complete jerk and you think you are Buddha now. <laughs> but generally speaking, it's good not to be affected by praise or blame. But here is in especially in terms of training uh, our bodhicitta. So if we're already training bodhicitta, then let's hope uh, you know enough, you know, not to be a jerk. <laughs> so given that you're already training bodhicitta, then it's saying, if you find that more and more, uh, you are not relying on other people telling you how well you're doing or how bad you're doing, but you are relying more and more on yourself because you know in the end, the only witness right, to your mind is your own mind. The only witness right, to what's going on in here is yourself. Some of us have a habit of going to teachers and say, how do you think I'm doing? How do you think I'm doing? You know? And some teachers will humor us and tell us, oh, yeah, you're doing well. You know, or, oh, you're not doing well, you know. Um, but, you know, maybe at the beginning we need to do this, yes. But if more and more, right, even with regards to a teacher, if more and more we find that, you know, we are gaining confidence, uh, good confidence, uh, skillful confidence, self-confidence, uh, that you know more and more, you know, no matter how much uh, my teacher might praise me uh, or praise me in front of people, oh, he's doing so well, he's doing so well. Only I know where I am. And so if you see that going on, then you know, ah, my dharma practice is going well. So this is what the fifth point is telling us. There are um, three more lines in the fifth point. This, again, organically, we'll look at this. Maybe next week, maybe week after next. Next week, I want to also begin to talk about Point number one, which is the preliminaries, which is those four thoughts that turn the mind, the four considerations. Right now, you know, especially uh, if you want to read a little, uh, and you can read this. It's good to read this kind of again and again. You know, let these one-liners kind of, you know, become more and more familiar. Uh, I would say, mm, read uh, the taking adversities onto the path of awakening, especially uh, the first one-liner, which basically says, you know, do not fear, do not fear difficulties. And so right now, you know, many of us are feeling kind of tight, very tight. In the Lojong traditions, it says, you know, this is a good opportunity. Pay attention to how tight we have become. Pay attention to how quickly we kind of lash out at others. During this difficult time that we are facing, 
I think uh, what I've seen with myself and with others, it brings the best and the worst out of people. So we should be very careful, you know, uh, in a way. And understanding that it will, it's going to, you know, even without us knowing it, suddenly it brings like the worst out of us. And when that comes out, you know, we cause harm. We harm ourselves, we harm others. And when we do that, there are consequences. And we will have to face those consequences. You cannot say, oh, you know, I, I, I was not feeling well, I was not feeling good, you should be understanding, you know. Yes, yes, of course, you know, people can be understanding. But karma is such that, you know, for every cause there is an effect. So be careful. Okay? But at the same time, you know, it can also very surprisingly bring out the best in us. And when that happens, you know, you have to rejoice in that. You have to say, oh, this is really wonderful, you know. And we have to learn how to recognize how it can bring out the best of other people. Especially the people that you find right now may be uh, particularly annoying to you right? because you might think, oh, you see, it's brought the worst out of this person. But don't fixate. Also say to yourself, you know, but it can also bring the best out of this person. I, it's just that I don't have the great fortune to see that. <laughs> so we should not make judgment. So with ourselves, know that this difficult time, it can either bring out the worst or bring out the best. So try to figure out ways for it to bring out the best in us. And even when the worst comes out, there is the benefit. Uh, it's said in the teachings, you know, the only good quality of non-virtue of negative karma is that it can be changed, it can be purified. And so in that way, you know, as much as we don't want to create negative karma and therefore experience, you know, negative conditions, unpleasant, undesirable situations, when that undesirable situation or condition has already turned up, we can still decide not to be a victim of it. And more importantly, not to create more negative karma in the midst of experiencing the fruition of negative karma. So this is what we can do. We can decide that. Every moment offers an opportunity to decide, am I going to practice bodhicitta or am I going to practice fixating on self? Every moment is a question mark. But don't listen to what I just said. Huh? with your type A personality, okay? Then you're gonna walk around like, oh, every moment, every moment, yeah? Mm -hmm. Fixating on self comes, remember, from a more general fixation, tightness. So learn how to, with breath, as you breathe in, experience a lot of space opening up inside. With every exhalation, experience the space that can be found as you expand out. Breathe in space, breathe out into space. Breathe in space, breathe out into space. That is also, right, the preliminary that we practice for Lojo. So it's not just counting breath to 21. 
to establish presence. But that presence is also related to absolute bodhicitta training, which is where we will go right, eventually. Absolute bodhicitta training. Then on the basis of this breath, counting breath and watching breath, is also how we are going to do the formal meditation for relative bodhicitta. Dongmen is also breath. Absolute bodhicitta is also breath, using breath. So a little taste of absolute bodhicitta I've, I've, I've shared tonight, which is you can think, you know, as you breathe in, breathe in space. As you, as you breathe out, breathe out into space. So now, you know, between this week and next week, when things trigger you, when situations, you know, make it really tight, breathe in the space and breathe out into space. Give yourself more space. Move around. Physically, you know, just move around. You know. When things get difficult, you know, just move around like that. And loosen things up. And remember to breathe in space and breathe out into space. So thank you for your patience. Uh, we went over a little uh, tonight. Uh, and sorry, uh, we I don't have time uh, to take questions. Um, but you can go ahead, maybe if you're on Facebook, and type your questions. Later, I'm going to look at them. Then next week, uh, before we start, start class, I'm going to look over those questions. And then I will answer it uh, during class time. Uh, so you can write your questions uh, or comments on Facebook comments. Uh, but I'm not going to answer there. You know, It takes too much time to type and write everything. Um, but I'll try to answer during class time next time. So we say at the very end of every uh, Dharma session, uh, we should think that you know, I'm doing this. We should remind ourselves, you know, why, why am I doing this? So in the Lojong tradition especially, we say, you know, we are doing this so that we can actualize bodhicitta. And to actualize this bodhicitta, what is this bodhicitta? This bodhicitta can also be expressed as one thing to free not just ourselves from suffering and the causes of suffering, but to free all, to free all beings from suffering and the causes of suffering. And one thing this so strongly that you will even be ready to give up your personal desire to be free from suffering if it can help others to be free. And so at the end, we want to say, we want to remember this and uh, the tradition is to say to dedicate the merit in other words, to dedicate whatever good, whatever that you have learned, whatever that you think has inspired you in the last hour and a half to two, dedicate that so that it is done for this bigger purpose. So that it's not just about I, me, and mine, but it is about the greater concern and the greater good. So we dedicate this to the greater good, to the freedom from suffering and the causes of suffering, to the attainment of happiness and the causes of happiness of all beings everywhere. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Thank you. Sure.